My name is Yuan Yuan Zhan. I am a postdoc at Fermilab. During this talk, I'll be talking about the importance of understanding systematic effects in cosmological analysis of galaxy clusters. This talk is based on a few papers, especially Wu Zhan in Prep and also DS2020. So, galaxy clusters. Um, Galaxy clusters are cosmic structures that has a lot of galaxies clustered together. In the context of late-time cosmic structure formation, galaxy clusters are considered the most massive gravitationally bound structures in the late universe. They are the peaks of the density field. That means their abundance are sensitive to cosmology. These two figures on this slide demonstrate how the galaxy clusters change depending on cosmological models. Their sizes and their abundances change a lot in a no dark energy scenario and a standard lambda CDM scenario. This slide, the figures here demonstrate further the sensitivity of galaxy clusters to cosmological parameters in a lambda CDM situation. The abundance of function of galaxy clusters, which is basically the number of densities of galaxy clusters in terms of their total masses, vary quite a bit depending on omega m and sigma 8. So that is something we can use to constrain sigma 8 and omega m. Given the sensitivity of galaxy clusters to cosmology, they have become a main topics, uh, topic um, in ongoing and future cosmic experiments, such as the Dark Energy Survey, or DES. As the most massive cosmic structures, galaxy clusters are pretty rare. Even for a deep survey like DES, we on average find about one cluster per 0.2 degree squares of the sky. That's one cluster per area of the moon. Fortunately, DS images about one eighth of the sky. So even in year one data alone, we have found about 6,500 galaxy clusters to redshift 0.7. And we expect to find about 30,000 clusters all the way to redshift 1.0 in our full data set. And that should be enough data to study some cosmology. But there is a difficulty that needs to be solved first though. Um, in theory, the abundance of galaxy clusters in terms of their total masses can be modeled from omega m and sigma 8. But in observational data set, we only know the abundance of galaxy clusters in terms of the sum of mass observables. Within DES, this mass observable is richness. So we only know the abundance function of the uh, galaxy clusters in terms of their richnesses. And therefore, to constrain cosmology, we need to be able to connect richness to galaxy clusters' total masses. Fortunately, DS is a lensing survey, and weak lensing is one of the most powerful ways to map out the total masses uh, of galaxy clusters. So this figure here shows our weak, uh, calibration results uh, of connecting cluster total masses measured from weak lensing to the cluster richness observable here. The DS calibration result is shown as the red line uh, there, um, previous uh, experiments and uh, all other experiments have tried to do this calibration as well. The results from SZ um, and also SDSS are shown by, uh, uh, as the blue lines and the orange lines there. And you can see that DS weak lensing gives us much more precise calibration over the cluster total mass and richness connections. 
this precision goes in large to the shear measurements precision from DES because we have a really large data set and also to the photometric redshift estimation from DES because we have the depth. It also, this precision, goes in large to our dedicated efforts to understand known systematic effects in galaxy cluster mass calibration. Especially, we spent quite a bit of efforts understanding the galaxy membership dilution in cluster weak lensing and also the miscentering statistics of galaxy clusters. Um, previously, these two effects can contribute somewhat a 5 to 10 percent uncertainty if we don't try to calibrate them. But with dedicated efforts, we were able to reduce their total uncertainties to under 1% to a level of being um, insignificant. Um, some people joke that our membership dilution and miscentering teams has tried really hard to make themselves unimportant. unimportant. So, we have the cluster abundance measurements in terms of richnesses and also the weak lensing mass calibration that connects the richnesses to cluster total masses. But before we derive um, the abundance data of clusters in terms of masses and compare that to theories, we discovered something that we didn't quite expect. A postdoc at Ohio State that worked at the NDES, um, Heidi Wu, she found that when she looked at the um, simulation cluster properties that were selected according to observational criteria, there was a bias in their weak lensing signals. Um, the bias goes like this. Um, she goes into the simulations and then observe, uh, apply the observational uh, selection criteria to the simulation clusters and then look at their lensing um, signals of these clusters. But these lensing signals of the clusters show significant deviation from the average clusters in the simulations before the selection. Um, that means we have some sort of significant selection bias there, and this selection bias gives us a mass um, bias at a level of about 20%, which is way much worse than the uncertainties that we had understood before. Is such a selection effect even possible? Yes, it is. Um, one physical effect that could result in this kind of bias is cluster orientation. We know that galaxy clusters are triaxial. Actually, most of the time they are ellipsoidal. Um, so when a galaxy cluster, when a, a ellipsoidal galaxy cluster happens to have their major axis aligned with the line of sight with the observer uh, verse on Earth, this galaxy cluster would look really dense with a lot of galaxies inside of them. And therefore, we would uh, easily pick them out in, observation, uh, in our observational selection criteria. But if the same cluster happens to be aligned on the plane of the sky, they will look more spread out and they might look like they don't even have a lot of galaxies in it. And as a result, this galaxy cluster might get missed in observational selections. A graduate student looked further into this effect in simulations, and he found that this effect is real. It is true. It does exist in simulations. Um, so this figure here shows the cluster's orientation angle distribution in the observationally selected cluster samples versus uh, the clusters before any selections. The clusters that have been ab uh, applied observational selections, their orientation distribution are shown as the colored histograms there. Um, and that the average clusters before any selection 
is uh, are the gray histograms there, you can see that there is a significant deviation. Um, uh, no matter what richness uh, selection criteria we apply. So it is real in simulations. Propagating that into weak lensing um, observables, we know for a while in weak lensing that clusters that are oriented um, along the line of sight towards us will have a uh, higher weak lensing signal than their true average signal. And the clusters that are rented on the plane of the sky will have a lower signal. Um, if we had a cluster sample that are randomly distributed um, uh, with regard to the orientations with no selection effect with regard to the uh, uh, orientations, this kind of upper and lower deviations would eventually cancel out. But once the cluster sample um, is biased in terms of their orientations, this effect won't be canceled out anymore. And Joan looked into the net effect after averaging the selected cluster uh, samples. He found the resulting mass, uh, uh, weak lensing mass deviations to be at a level of about 5%, and it has some radio dependence. Now comparing to what Joey has estimated to what Heidi has found in observational um, in simulations, these two effects have similar radio shape. Um, Joey's effect is at about 5% and Heidi's effect is at 20%. So obviously it partially explains uh, the selection bias but it seems that there is something more going on. Think that something could be the projection effect of correlated and uncorrelated structures around the galaxy clusters. The argument for that is if we look at the weak lensing signals of, uh, of the observational selected galaxy clusters in simulations and compare that to the average clusters in simulations, but matching their orientation and projection strength uh, distributions to the observationally selected clusters, then their average uh, lensing signals ratios would look like the orange line in this plot, which is in much better agreement compared to the blue lines here um, before any orientation and projection effect matching. This result is currently still being studied by a couple of students. So we will need to wait to hear from them to see if we have the whole stories yet. Now moving back to cosmology, um, we don't have a, uh, a perfect understanding of the systematic effects yet, but we can apply the crude estimations from simulations from Heidi to our weak lensing calibration results and see what cosmology we get. The cosmology we get is uh, the gray contour lines here. Um, in comparison, uh, cosmological constraints, omega m and sigma eight, from other experiments are shown as these colored lines there. The cluster cosmology um, result shows a bit of a deviation from the other experiments. There could be something interesting going on there. We had a discussion about that in EFS 2020, um, but more importantly, we need to have a better understanding of systematic effect to confirm its cosmology result. So to summarize, um, DES has acquired leading precisions with regard to measuring galaxy cluster observables, especially the cluster weak lensing mass calibration observables. The mass calibration is precise enough to uncover previously undetected selection effect. And we are currently 
uh, further investigating what this selection effect could be and how much biases they produce. And future cluster cosmology analysis needs to have a, a better modeling of selection effects. That's all. Thank you.